different way. So uh, you can see a typical fungal infection. So remember we told you the story of the HPV, the tree man, but this basically happens in ch ch kids. So you can see one of the kids, uh, if you see this kind of a picture, then you start thinking in your mind because I'm presenting it in, uh, in a class of fungal metabolism, but differential diagnosis is uh, you have to think, what is it? It could be a skin infection that you saw. It could be a drug reaction, I can tell you that. Uh, it could be immunodeficiency. It could be cancer. What else could it be? It could be metastasis. But there are a lot of different things that may happen. So in a, in a, in a phys physician's clinic, if you see patient presenting, patient don't, don't present like, this is not the presentation of the patient with a fungal infection. It doesn't come like that. Right? So basically it comes with a problem. They don't come with exactly a fungus, big fungus growing on their, on their head. So you go, oh yeah, that's a fungal infection. But uh, that would have been easy though. So they do come with a skin rash, skin problem, and so on and so Okay? And uh, what I want you to do, especially for all those lectures that I'm going to take you through because I'm going to present a lot of clinical stuff, and uh, I want you to concentrate on treatment part because that will be good for you to learn. One of the important things, uh, I'm just going to give you some highlight on that. And you can see from the things, especially for drug development, I'll do that in, in detail. Most of you, sometimes even people ask me as well, so what's the best antifungal uh, cream for my athlete's foot? So people have accepted it's going to come over and over again. And what is it I need to know? If you go for today for buy a, a cream, an antifungal cream for uh, your athlete's foot, you'll see that most of them end with azoles. So they are azole compounds. Right? I want you to start thinking of azole. Then they will have polyene compounds. And then some, um, some of them may have a 5-flocytosine. So 5-flocytosine is an anti-cancer drug as well because it's going to block the synthesis of DNA, DNA, RNA. So that again will help you to treat some of the very severe forms of the uh, diseases. So uh, as I said earlier, uh, there are some of the key points. You can always uh, try to test yourself for concept. And I will keep pointing to you as you move along for these set of lectures. So let me begin uh, in the next 10 minutes and see how long do I go for the first clinical setup for superficial and cutaneous mycosis. And again, when I say superficial and cutaneous, I'm talking about skin. Okay, and you pretty much know uh, skin because we did do skin in detail as a physiology. So superficial mycosis is limited to the outermost layer of skin and hair. So also keep in mind, skin and hair are appendage. They come from the same kind of uh, structure. And cutaneous basically is something that goes a little bit deeper than that, especially deeper than epidermis. Okay, those of you who want to uh, recap and want to go and look at the skin lectures again, I would spend some time on that. But you can see from here, this is the structure of the skin on the left hand side. And if you see, we have an epidermis and all those kind of funny layers that we discussed of epidermis with stratum corneum on the top a general cell layer, spinous layer, and the basal layer, and that's a very thick layer, and you have a dermis, and then hypodermis, where subcutaneous fat is. And if you remember when I taught you skin physiology, I said some of them don't include hypodermis as a part of skin, but that's the fatty tissue where it goes. Now you can see on the other side over there that you need to know where are these, the uh, root of the hair, for example, where are capillaries? Right? And there are different structures of the cell, and then you can also see typical uh, lesions that we normally see in terms of skin infections. So depending upon how deep this fungi has gone, uh, you will see the effect of it. For example, the fungi goes over there in messes up your melanin, for example. So melanin is the one that produces your skin color. So you will see a change in the skin color. So you'll see that change. Okay? Now, uh, skin
skin physiology will be the basis for you to understand this clinical setup, okay? And also keep in mind that uh, many times, if you are a little bit in R&D, that we may use a component of a fungi that messes up or kind of maneuvers or alternates your melanin, it could be used as some of the drugs that people would say to change your skin color. You can say whatever color you want to have, but it can go and kind of change that up. But if you look at the e ecology for that, that's what we have in our mind that uh, most of the people who are there, like a geographical distribution, other than the environmental factors, that people who are towards the midline will be darker in color as compared as you move up and down both ways. So that's like a, we call the multiple envir environmental factors. That's what people think. Okay. Now, this happens to be uh, one of the most important slides that you want to cram it, remember it. And you can see from here that when I say a particular, for example, I'm going to talk about superficial, cutaneous, and subcutaneous. So keep that in mind. What do I mean? So you can see from the top, top extreme that epidermis, the green one, is the one, the penetration of this fungi in the depth of the skin. That's called superficial infection. And then cutaneous comes where you have the epidermis plus the top layer of the stratum corneum and a little bit deeper. And then subcutaneous, you can see, pretty much covers everything. So don't think that they, they exist separately. So if you pay attention to the slide on the right hand side, so the cutaneous will cover both. So, so cutaneous will have superficial as well. And subcutaneous will have superficial and cutaneous because this is how the, the invasiveness of the skin goes. And then again, if you breathe in the lungs, it's going to go into your blood, it's going to go into your kidneys, it's going to go into your urinary bladder, it can even go into your brain for systemic mycosis. So let's talk about superficial mycosis today. Uh, they colonize the outermost layer of skin, hair, and nails. And the concept over here I want you to keep in mind is that this fungi is going to destroy the keratinized outer layer. So this fungi is keratinolytic. It's going to go for a protein which is keratin. And this keratin is present in your skin, hair, and your nails. And also keep in mind, I told you from the drug development point of view, if you pick up the compound that discolors that or changes the nature of it, you can use it for developing all those lotions and creams and so and so that we normally use. Now, uh, also keep in mind that infection due to these organisms, they lit elicit little or no host immune response and are non-destructive and thus asymptomatic. The reason is because the immune cells are a little bit deeper. The immune cells don't see them, so they are a little bit deeper. So superficial mycosis is going to be left alone. So you will have to deal with it, okay? And then again, why do we people, why do we care? Because that's what people see. So it's most of the cosmetic concern. And many a time people will notice it, patients will bring it to you, they will come and show you. One of the commonest things that we see in superficial mycosis is called tenia. You'll see uh, all these creams today, you can go and find out everything beginning with tenia. And basically, one of the diseases that I'm going to discuss today is called uh, pityriasis versicolor. So that's the tenia problem that we normally see is one of the most common fungal infections seen worldwide. So this is, happens to be one of the most common. It is uh, present in some tropical environments and it affects 60% of population. So 60% of us uh, have that problem. So what this is the name of the disease. What is the name of the fungi that causes this problem? Melasesia furfur. So that's the name of exactly like S. aureus, Melasesia furfur. So M. furfur. That's what it is. Okay. If you look at uh, skin scrapings, we kind of take the scraping off and look at these cells. They are like yeast-like cells, three to eight micrometer. 
and then they basically can be cultured. And then if you look at, for example, under the uh, microscope, this is how they look like. You can see from here, this is a petriasis versicolor from the skin scraping, short, and they look like a branched hyphae. They look like a branched hyphae. So you can see the branched hyphae. If you look like electron micrograph, in a deeper part, you can see you know, the birding taking place. That's what I was talking about, the tiny birding that we have. If you want to look at the typical appearance that we call spaghetti or meatball appearance, that again is a very common question and very uh, important aspect of melasesia fervor. So that's important. And I'm not going to spend much time on immunology, but I do have some slides that uh, you can read it on your own and pretty much will tell you how if the immune response was to be exposed, how is it going to deal with that particular uh, part. If you look at epidemiology, as I said earlier, it's worldwide. Young adults are most commonly affected and uh, M. furfur is not found at saprophytic in nature and it's not in animals. So human infection is the major problem that we have. And if you look at the presentations that we normally get for these cases, and remember, one of the most important thing that uh, I talked about, that it affects the whole skin of the people, and then it causes discoloration. So this is something that interferes with your melanin. So that's, again, important. So people who are dark-skinned, it will hypopigment them. And people who are light-skinned, they're going to show like pale brown. So opposite to that. So it depends upon which we uh, it occur. If it affects hair follicles, so it's going to cause inflammation of hair follicle, which is called folliculitis, parafolliculitis, or sometimes it may form an abscess. So the typical feature that you normally will see, this is how they present. Multiple pale brown hyperpigmentation patches. So this is a typical presentation that we normally get. Or you can get pigmentation like this. So these are some of the uh, especially scaly and red. So you will see, especially on the body, scaly and red pigmentation, and this is a fungal infection. Sometimes, especially, it's difficult to treat, uh, especially, uh, I would say, uh, young children, and they will present like this. So you can see big rashes, very superficial, and then they have a very clear margin. So as I said earlier, you should not it's not easy to diagnose, but if you see a typical picture, the other important thing that you will see that they form rings. So we some also call them ring infection. They form rings, and you can see this child has this ring, and then again one under there we call them ringworm as well. So they're not worms, but they appear like a ringworm on the left hand side, and then a very severe form where it becomes. Especially in this case, the person is immunocompromised, and especially over there again. Depending upon how is your immune response, if there is secondary infection, this is what you see for superficial mycosis. Uh, again, uh, tinea can happen, it's like back, upper back, on the face, on the hair-like structures. That's what you typically see. And uh, for lab diagnosis, again, uh, I'm going to present two more slides and I'll let you go. For lab diagnosis, keep a standard lab diagnosis. So you will see that slide repeated over and over again. We look under the microscope, we call it direct microscopic visualization. And what we do is we take 10% KOH or caco white flower, uh, caco, calco flower white and look at the stain. That's one thing. And many times those of you who went to a physician, they have a wood lamp. So they will use the wood lamp and this will shine, right? Or you can do culture on Saberot agar. And the last slide for this superficial one is again treatment. Uh, they are, if they are not chronic, they usually are chronic and persistent, then you really have to interfere. You have to use tropical azole. I gave you an example for azole, and especially if it happened like a dandruff. Dandruff is a part of that. And the commonest medical treatment for dandruff is selenium sulfide. So that's a shampoo that you want to use. Or if it's very severe, we use oral antifungal drugs, and I want you to remember at least two for today, ketoconazole and itraconazole. So these are some of the two antifungal drugs that we normally come across and treat. So I'll stop here.